Welcome to WebRush, the weekly talk show that brings you stories of real world development from industry experts and developers like you and me. Each week, Ward Bell, Dan Walleen, Craig Shoemaker, and John Papa find out what it takes to write, deploy, and maintain apps that stand up to the demands of the real world. And now, here are your hosts. Hello, welcome back to WebRush show 156. Ward, welcome. Happy Friday. How are you doing today? Oh, I had one of those rare experiences, a reboot of my computer without issue. <laughs> <laughs> that is rare. <laughs> you, know, you know, you you push those fingers down and you just hope for the best, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it'll actually leave your operating system alone instead of trying to install something that doesn't work. Uh, but it, it worked. And uh, here I am uh, in time for our podcast. What I think is bananas is the fact that we still have to do that today in order to get things to work correctly. And my seven-year-old just came into my office uh, like an hour ago. My 12-year-old was having a problem with, with the computer and, and the youngest was like, well, why don't you just reboot it? It's like, this is just, you know, common knowledge. Like, you got to try that out. Yeah. So. Hey, if you, do you know what a Texas reboot is? I do not. That's where you pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> just force it down. That's it, baby. <laughs> That's just awesome. pull the plug, pull the battery. That's a Texas reboot. <laughs> Well, on the other side of the spectrum, where things work well and are well-architected, I'd like to introduce Natalia Vendito to the show. Natalia has a background in architecture of buildings and design and started out building websites in the early 2000s. She worked as a front-end developer, a technical lead, a software architect, and now is in the role of solution architect with MongoDB. Ward, hit us. <laughs> Natalia, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Ward. Nice to be here. <laughs> well, Ward has got, got us all set up with uh, the sound effects. I'm sure we'll get lots of surprises as we go along. Solutions Architect with MongoDB. That, that's got to be a fun and interesting role. Yeah, it is. And particularly because I work in the corporate um, division, let's say. That means that I work with startups and all the fun people and the agile people and people that have really interesting problems with really intensive or data intensive applications. So it's fun. It's really challenging. <laughs> Many of my clients are still in the SQL world and you have a background in SQL in the SQL world. Uh, but they keep uh, asking me, uh, you know, or, or trying to convince their CIOs anyway, that they should Get this. Get rid of this SQL stuff and go to a, a no document, a no SQL database. Um, no document. That's you can see where my brain goes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, then I have to talk them off the ledge. Um, not because I think uh, I, I think that other stuff is bad, but I do have this feeling that um, people think uh, that it's magic. So you've lived in both worlds. Um, how do how do you like to think about about this? I'm not. We're not looking for thumbs up, thumbs down. We're looking for how do you think about it? Okay, so I think every solution, and I said it before in this show when we were here talking about micro frontends, every solution has a it's, it's there for a reason, right? If you have a problem and you decide on an architecture, make your architecture decisions based on that problem you're trying to solve. SQL databases solve a problem and they have been solving that problem for 40 years and they have been doing it right. And then we have new problems as technology evolves and data becomes larger and we're producing more and more data and different types of data. And then there are these new databases on the, on the block that are here to help solve those problems. So I don't think you, you just need to, from my perspective, having worked with SQL databases, you just have the, to replace them because there is hype or because there is another option. You have to migrate only when you have the real need because you are feeling constrained in a certain way. You either cannot you know, go to market fast enough, for example, because you have to do some 
processes before updating or modifying your model, or there is a, a real pain that you are trying to mitigate by changing the model behind your database. So I started, like you said, I, I come from the SQL world as well. Um, when I learned to develop, I did with PHP and MySQL, and that was the default, right? <laughs> well, you don't have an audio for that, <laughs> like, boo. <laughs> <laughs> You need to find one. Um, I have a. So I'm sure I have a sound effect for <laughs> PHP here somewhere. But I think that wasn't either. <laughs> 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 that wasn't my decision either, right? It was. It was an opinion of the of the content management systems we I was using back in the day, right? And and most of them that I used that were. You, you can prepare that sound again. Joomla and WordPress and Drupal, they all, uh, well, worked with my CEO. Yeah. They were there. They were there. Yeah. <laughs> they were there. <laughs> this is funny. We talked, we, you know, we met Lampoon earlier technologies, but they, they were breakthroughs at the time. Yeah. Um, and we, all technology is with, you know, has to be placed in its historical context. And so the only crime is to start a PHP project today, <laughs> not that you did it back then. Uh, so uh, just like jQuery was just amazing. Uh, and it is, you know, it is an amazing piece of technology. Um, and so uh, it was a breakthrough, but it's, it, it would be a crime today. It wasn't a crime in the day. So we, we uh, make, we kid because we love. So anyway, Back to your story. So you did that stuff and you had my secret. Exactly. And it, it it was working fine back in the day, like we said, because we had other requirements. Like, I, I don't think that I heard of, I don't even think I heard the term SLA back in the day, or at least where I was working, right? We didn't have those SLAs of nine nines <laughs> or four nines. And um, you, you had a requirement for a throughput of X, and a requirement for latency of whatever, and everything had to be real time, and the data had to come back real fast because we were also mostly working with static content, right? You, you, you had those content management systems that serve the purpose of, you know, rendering pages that users went and read and closed. And that's yeah, it. and that's a lot of sites to this day. That's a lot of stuff until this day. So that. That stuff works. But now, now where you are, you have different demands, right? Well, where I am right now, we have one demand, right? To change the world with one technology. But where I was before, <laughs> <laughs> where I was before. No big deal. Exactly. Yeah, we were very ambitious. But until six months ago, when I joined MongoDB, I was working as a technical lead, as an architect, um, in a different kind of context. And these particularly the front ends were a lot more dynamic. And so users do a lot more stuff at a site, at an application, on their phones. They want to get the data right away. And also there are multiple applications of, of data or of, of implementations that require different types of data to be saved to a database. And SQL didn't really make it or really or wasn't really the, the solution for every one of those right so there, there there were for example use cases involving IOT use cases involving uh, what is called as a time series that you have to you know evaluate data over time as it changes and collect it and and analyze it and that's really difficult to do in a SQL database. So John, one of the things I like about AG Grid, which is a, a data grid component for the kind of complex uh, grid scenarios that we encounter all the time in enterprise apps. One of the things I really like about it is that it works for a variety of frameworks, Angular, React, Vue, or, or just vanilla JS. Does that ring a bell for you? No, it really does. There's all these different companies that I work with where they have 
no choice but to use a lot of these different tools because they have different teams working on them. So being able to port their code or share that code and that technical investment they have is really important to them. Yeah, well, it's important to us, uh, ideally, and we're a consulting company. And, uh, you know, we never know what our client's going to want to use, Angular, React, or Vue. But they're all going to need a grid. And it's great to be able to reach for uh, the one grid that works everywhere, AG Grid. You know, at, at any size company, too, because you could have these teams that maybe they only use one framework, but eventually they're going to switch to another one and be able to take that investment again and use it, reuse it is really nice. So if a multi-framework data grid makes sense to you, please. Go check out AG Grid at ag-grid.com. So you're you're brushing up on on this, like how to think about databases in different ways, and and if you could help give a, a mental model to people to say, okay, there's this type of database, and in general, and because of course you can use technology in a number of different ways, things always depend, you know, usual caveats. But if you were to say, okay. This is SQL. It's good in these types of situations. This is NoSQL. It's good in these types of situations. How how would you break those up? I think SQL still works really, really well when you need consistency. Like, you, you know, you have a, a schema governing your data, right? And you need to make sure that, you know, that's going to be the model for a very long time. So you model it, you implement this, ORMs that need to be in between your development and the database, and it's done once, and you know it's not going to be changing very frequently. And you also need to, for example, give asset guarantees to your transactions. Let's imagine we are on a mission critical application. It's a bank, and you need to make sure that you have what asset provides you. I don't know if it's it's a good idea to remind the, the, the audience what ACID is. Um, it's a principle that guarantees that every transaction is atomic, is, um, is consistent, is, it's, it's isolated from other transactions, and it's durable, right? So all those things are done very, very well by SQL. And this is why we, and even myself, have selected SQL databases to be behind these type of applications because they really solve this problem very, very well. Now, when, like mentioned, you have use cases, uh, we were working with this very large client that I, I cannot mention for some reasons, but they they are on the um, electro electronics and, and home appliances. And now everyone wants to be connected to the internet. Right? So these home appliances are collecting information about their usage, about their, um, their performance, about the, 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 the times when the users have it on and how long a cycle lasted. All this type of data that is being collected very frequently and is changing over time. And also you have, if you're the, the, the people behind these implementations, you have many... Um, different models, you probably want to go with a more flexible data model. And in this case, you have other options. You have document model, you have um, key values, maybe that serves your pur purpose, um, and, and some other va more variety, let's say, to choose from, because it's not really important to you to have an asset transaction or an asset guarantee. You have other uh, problems to solve. Yeah, I have a, I have a, uh, I have a, a an additional take on that. Um, uh, you know, the middle letter in SQL stands for query, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's the the real breakthrough for SQL was that you could uh, query your data from many different angles, and uh, thanks to joins and relationships, uh, and Therefore, you know, the the structure of the data as you might want to consume it isn't baked in to a SQL database. Um, and when you have lots and lots of pieces, as you do, for example, in a CRM system or an inventory management system where you've got customers and uh, orders and locations, and, you know, and you just look at the model, it just sort of, it just explodes in terms of the number of 
dimensions upon which you, you know, things that you would want. And you have some things called like relational integrity <laughs> so that, uh, a, a, you know, invoices have a common customer. And if you change the customer, you don't want to go visit all those invoices and patch up their customer records and all this other stuff. So, so you have that, you have relational integrity, you have all of these aspects, and you also have the, 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 the characteristics that the most, one of the most important things you can do is go at that data from different angles and not even be able to know ahead of time, not be able to bake into the structure what those angles are. It has always struck me that this is underappreciated about, about SQL databases because the other ones, the competitors are all out for optimizing other things and they work best, it seems to me. When the model is very well defined, has a is going to have a long life that way. Where the con, where the way it's consumed, at least when you're doing it along the most optimal speed paths, is the same every time. Where you have yes, a graph of objects, but they don't change much. So you're willing to give up um, uh, uh, rapid relational integrity and stuff like that, um, uh, and. And of course, time series data is exactly like that, right? There's not a lot of dimensions to it. Like if you think of a stock ticker, right? You know, you got a price, you got a ticker, you got you got a date, and you got a lot of it, right? <laughs> it's not, it's you know, and, right. and uh, I'm not linking that up to a whole bunch of things that might change or anything like that. You know, I got and so it's uh, and it's coming at you just in a flood, and um, you want opt- you want to optimize that. So so yeah, small model. Pretty clear how you're going to approach it. Not likely that you're going to change it in real time later. You can, you can of course, replicate the model to query over it and analyze it any way you want later. But like right now, this is what I do. I, I think that that difference in, in data model and what you need to do with it is underappreciated. Um, so anyway, you just heard my rant on it. Sorry. No, no, but you just you just asked me. Yeah, I mean, you just set me up, and I just went crazy. So there you are. Back to you. But it's it's perfectly valid, and and that richness of 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 a very extensive model uh, that you can query from different perspectives, like you said, makes it also. Uh, difficult to treat in certain situations. And I think this is another one of the problems that these new databases came to solve. And it's the problems, the problem of um, distribution, right? So when we think about taking those databases to the cloud and distributing them across many nodes, can be virtual, physical, and particularly across many regions, even geographically, or to solve the problem of sometimes data locality, which is regulations that we didn't have to think about back in the day of SQL, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. For example, if I am a user in Germany and the government says, all your data has to stay in Germany and another user in whatever other place and their data has to stay there. So these SQL databases with all those tables that you can join, that you can connect, that you can reference, are not really well suited to distribute geographically. Yep, that's that's the, that's the Achilles heel is is you can, distributed transactions are death, uh, mm. and um, yeah, you know having to reach great distances to push pull things together. Uh, then you got you, you, no, it doesn't work. You want to replicate. You want to have. You want to deal with a fact that yeah maybe it's worth having the customer repeat you know customer information repeated multiple times within an object graph somewhere else which is kind of how you would do it in no in a NoSQL that many don't know SQL databases uh, and you're willing to make that trade off exactly. uh, so you're you're absolutely right that and that's a pressure that we're feeling in applications today that we didn't feel back in 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 my absolutely as 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 laws progress and, and, and governance of the internet and the data of the user, which is really necessary because we are sharing every day copious amounts of data, personal, uh, sensitive information. We need more regulation. And obviously every, every jurisdiction, every country, every, every um, administration wants to be owner of the data of their citizens or whatever. And it makes 
real sense. So now we're distributing systems, but there are certain constraints and the constraints come um, dictated by those laws. And I think it's it's really good in, in that sense. It's, it's a benefit. <laughs> and, and like you're saying, even like just 100% man, like sometimes you don't have a choice. It's just like, this is how it must be. If we were to take this down to even more of a practical level and talk about some of your experiences and in, in different implementations that you've had, you know, what what kind of stories can you tell us about? You know, I, I don't know. Do you have a project where you started out thinking or building it one way, and you soon realized, oh, we need to go another direction, or do you have something even where like you got to the finish line and you realized this was really the choice that we needed to make, and that all these benefits came from it? Well, I have made the choice of SQL databases in the past, and and they are still there. So when, whenever, like we, we mentioned, whenever there is no change in the model, that comes frequently and and on every iteration, and you don't have to worry about all the overhead that that means. Um, it's perfectly fine because when you update the model, you come across some other tasks that you have to do with. And we mentioned this, this, this additional layers in between your development or your application and the database. And the fact that SQL databases, when updated, usually have to be put offline. So you need maintenance windows. So you need to think uh, about the business impact of this. However, there was an application for which we selected PostgreSQL as a database because PostgreSQL is, it's, it's like, it's, I mean, uh, it's something that you want to go with if you don't want to get stuck with Oracle, for example. And it's, <laughs> and pay perhaps the licenses that you have to pay with Oracle. Um, and it's also, perceived at least by the developer community as a more progressive SQL database and more um, sophisticated than MySQL, right? Or MariaDB, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it seemed like a good choice. And we could also store JSON data and query JSON data from PostgreSQL. But it didn't happen to be in the end, it didn't happen to work as um, as simply as we expected, especially the, the querying the, the JSON data part. It was more complex than we expected. And because we had a, a model that was changing quite rapidly, uh, we decided to, to migrate to a document model. And that was before I was with MongoDB. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't biased. Full, full disclosure. Yeah, I wasn't biased. Yeah, it's always been a party trick, it seems to me, when they bolt on to a SQL database the ability to uh, query some um, uh, data that's hiding within one of the fields. Yeah, it's a lovely party trick. It's great to be able to have it. But it, it, it uh, yeah, it's, it's questionable whether that's going to scale. It's it's great to have for occasional use, but it can't be fundamental. If if that's fundamental the way you're you're querying your database, then you got the wrong database. Absolutely. And we were thinking about scalability at that point, and we were thinking about also data retention, which is one of the um, aspects you have to think about when you uh, select your database. The cost of having cold data, for example, data that you are not going to access uh, very frequently after a certain time, and then you want to probably offload or to, to, to object storage, you want to move to a cheaper kind of storage. And then you think, okay, let's, let's try, try to work with types of data that then you can offload, but you can query eventually if there is the requirement to do so. Um, but yes, it, it, for, for that particular case, it didn't work. We had to go uh, full document model after a while. And, and obviously, it's something that, that, that is very costly, right? Changing, migrating the database. It's, 
it's costly. Well, you, yeah. you have not only do you have the data, but then you have tooling, um, you have reporting, you have this the skill of the, the people working on it. I mean, it's yeah, I, I can imagine. Definitely. Hey, John, I have this great idea for a mobile app. I want to use native features like the camera, photo gallery, and geolocation, but I just don't have the time to learn a new language like Swift. Yeah, but you do know JavaScript and web tech like React, Angular, and Vue, right? I do, but how does that help me? Well, if you use the Ionic framework, you can use your JavaScript skills and you get fully styled iOS and Android mobile components. Plus, it uses the capacitor to talk to all the native device platforms. So if I use Ionic and Capacitor, I don't have to learn a new language. My JavaScript skills give me what I need to build a cross-platform app. Absolutely. And you can check it out at ionic.link slash webrush. I'll do it. D d diving down a little bit more in into the issue that you faced there, was it the, the querying issue that became a problem or was it more of the scalability issues that, that were giving you difficulty? We had, we had different problems. We had the, the querying issue, we had the scalability issue uh, for reasons that we mentioned earlier. And we had a migration in between providers also. And because the APIs were different in between providers to query this same database, that also caused a lot of overhead. So in the middle of this migration from one cloud provider to another, we discovered that the database was, although it was PostgreSQL, it wasn't really the same, uh, the, the, it didn't provide the same APIs as we expected it to be, like the, the consistency between APIs wasn't, wasn't there. Really? And, and it was nominally the same versions of SQL, but it wasn't the same of, of Postgres? Exactly. It was not the same. Wow. I did not know about that. <clears throat> so that... That would yeah, worry me. That, <laughs> yeah, you should look into that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm used to using, you know, Microsoft uh, SQL Server stuff, and that doesn't happen there. You can lift that. Uh, you, know, you know, if you've got one version, you've got one version. It's going to work wherever they plunk it down. And it's available by, you know, in a number of cloud providers and all that other stuff. So uh, it's kind of stunning to me that you don't have that that API stability uh, behind Postgres that, that comes as well. But I'm easily surprised. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things. So so let me throw a challenge at you. Uh, again, most of my I haven't I haven't gone near these in a long time, but. But one of the things that was worrying was when you had to change the structure of one of these, maybe even one of the ones you've mentioned along the way, data, um, uh, databases, uh, NoSQL databases, that uh, that, that was r really hellish, that, that you really had to bring the whole thing down and it wasn't always, it could be on for a long time. Um, and you could even blow the address space and length of stuff that you could have in an object graph. So you would really have trouble re-architecting that. Now that was sufficiently long ago that maybe that's, that's not something you've run into, but it was my impression. It, it's a la you know how it is when you touch the stove, when you're a child, you never want to go near the <laughs> stove again. Right. So I got burned. Um, but is that, uh, how do you cope with, um, uh, periodic, um, Let's say, let's call them scheme, even though they don't have, officially have a schema, let's admit that every data, every, every time you, well, tell me, let, let me back up. Maybe that's not a given. So, because everybody says schema list, but I've never put data anywhere that didn't have implicit schema at least. So when, tell me what happens as you, as data evolve and data structures evolve, how is, is that a no brainer these days? Because it wasn't back then. Okay. So I cannot answer this question for all the document databases, right? Although many of them work on top of the same underlying API and or model. Um, I can tell you how it works for Mongo if you, if you would like to know how that problem is solved because that I see every, every day. Um, and now I do use Mongo in all my Angular projects. Every Angular project I am working on the side, I am, Using Mongo. Fantastic. So, 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 start with the schema thing. 
Is there a schema or am I just so old school that it's there don't is even a think schema? About there is a schema. The difference or why we say it's schemaless is because you don't have to model or you don't have to compose that schema before you start developing, which is the case of SQL databases. So in C- for SQL databases, you first go with the schema, then you write your application on top of that schema. For NoSQL databases, usually you can start writing your code, you can start storing things in the database, and you can write your schema later and you can enforce JSON validation upon that schema at any time. So that's the difference. And whenever that schema changes, what happens is because most NoSQL databases are, um, they, they, they were designed with high availability in mind. They usually use replication, right? So uh, what happens is you impose that schema to one of the nodes. When it works, you change the primary or the the one the, the, the node where, where the writes go to, you enforce the schema in another one, then you change the primary again until all the nodes that are part of that replica set or that are part of that high availability strategy, whatever it is, are um, responding or or being or enforcing this schema. And this is... What am I looking at in terms of if I wanted to roll one of those out? You know, let's assume I've had it all tested. I knew what I was doing because, of course, one does that before you ever get everybody, world, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, everybody does that. I mean, that goes without saying. So, uh, so now uh, today's the day. Uh, what are we looking at in terms of a rollout across, uh, say, five nodes? Oh, you can have a change of primary in as. Less as four seconds. So I can percolate this this change that I've already approved across all of my nodes in under a minute. Then. Absolutely, because there is there is okay. a there you can either enforce this, you can do it manually, right? If you are, for example, uh, managing your own infrastructure, you w- will want to do it manually, or you can force an election of a new primary and then shut down the primary and there will be an election and all this will take place. Now, that that doesn't transform all the data in that time because part of the problem here is that, let's say I want to add a field that I think is going to be necessary everywhere. I mean, that's one of the simplest changes you can make. Um, But I got to go, I can't just go up, you know, in the SQL world, you just add the field to the table, done. Uh, in, In this no document world, what do I do to um, percolate that across all of the existing data? Well, it, it works in the same way uh, through replication because everything you do, like that modifies a document, gets logged, right? And the log is what's used to replicate. So in the next iteration of replication, then that field is going to get copied to the other nodes. And they, this was like the, the strength of, of CouchDB for a long, long time, right? That was like their differentiator among the contemporaries ex- of being able to do that quick replication. Exactly. So, so, so is it that like Mongo and, and, and some of these other competing products um, have gotten just as good at that feature as everyone else? Or, or is it just like everybody's pretty much providing this feature generally in lockstep because it's it's such a, a, yeah. a fundamental need. I don't want to say everybody, again, because I don't know the capabilities of every single um, database, but in general, replication and the ability to change the model very quickly is something that everyone needs and demands and that has a lot of focus. Uh, or it's a focus for the for the developers of the databases. Well, and it, it's it's even more of a safe operation too. Like because because I remember on SQL systems that, that I've worked on in the past, like you know you add a field, and if you have a SQL statement that's just grabbing all columns, now all of a sudden you have an extra column in your in your query, like that can do, cause a runtime error, Absolutely. like super easy. Absolutely. And so you, you don't you don't necessarily have that. I mean, of course, there could be something within your code that could blow up if you have an extra property in your object. But 
it sounds like that that kind of a situation is a little less likely in this type of a situation. It, it's it's never going to happen because null or not having that field or not having a value for a field doesn't produce errors by default, by design. You can you can force that on the application side, on the driver, right? If you really need it. Um, but by design, that's not going to happen. What can happen is that if you have a concern, a, write, a read concern to one of the nodes in particular, and that means that you have connected your application to a certain node and that field wasn't replicated, obviously that data is not going to be available. But again, it's so quick in the, um, the, the, the replication, depending on the size of the uplog. I mean, depending on how many operations you did sure. uh, and, and, and how many modifications you did. But we are talking in the range of seconds or minutes. And that's a global distribution? That's a global distribution. So can I ask you about relational integrity? I'll give you a little example. Let's suppose we have something where Craig, I, I always pick on Craig. It's part of the fun it's of the easy. show. <laughs> it's easy. And it's so easy. You know, suddenly, you know, he's, he's, he's been very active over the years and he's, he appears everywhere uh, throughout, uh, through, through a lot of the data. And suddenly Craig decides not to pay his bills or he does something horrible and we have to ban him. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, in SQL, I just flipped the switch and uh, because everybody's going to do a join against uh, uh, the, uh, the person table and they're going to realize that uh, immediately the Craig is persona non grata. <laughs> uh, but how, how, do we, uh, how do we make them persona non grata uh, effectively? This is the relational integrity problem, right? Because if you've replicated him everywhere, you got to go find him everywhere and plug his value. Or am I completely off base on that? Talk to me. I think that the the difference here is how you store that data. Yes, relational integrity because you have many tables and then you have references of keys, and this is how you design your model. In document databases, the premise is that everything you access together, you store together. That's not always the case, right? You, there may be times when you want to also create references. Like you, you may decide to go with sub documents in the same document, or perhaps if you are going to be accessing part of that data or a subset of that data, you may want to move it to a different collection altogether. Uh, you will make persona non grata by reference, like and in cascade. So every instance of Craig will disappear from this show because the reference, the ID. He'll be flagged as somebody we yeah, shouldn't be listening the to. The identifier <laughs> of Craig uh, will flag him as persona non grata. <laughs> we never delete anyone. We just. <laughs> Just, make just them disable miserable. them. No That's delay. Good. Just That's disable it. That's <laughs> it. We cut them off at the knees. We, That's it. We erase them. <laughs> right. So, so you know, you, you've upset my apple cart, and I love that. Um, there are apples all over the floor. Uh, so now I'm beginning to think, wow, maybe those people are right. Maybe uh, maybe we should get off this, this out of the SQL apple cart, and we should just sign up. Uh, it, all right, so I know it's there's a tremendous pain in, in taking an existing application and moving it. So let's leave that aside. Um, if I'm looking at a new project, um, should I always go with uh, a Mongo or um, uh, do I still have, um, there's still I have choices I should make uh, from your perspective? I think there are databases that are very dedicated like we said in, at the beginning, in solving certain problems. And because they are so focused, I mean, in general, document databases, because they are like a superset, they can store many things, many different types of data. So they are likely a good uh, solution for many, many use cases. Um, but then there are some databases that take care of certain problems. Like, I don't know, let's think, let's talk about Redis. Redis, that is a, key value database, very simple. You can use a cache. Um, 
If you need to solve that problem, go with Redis, right? If you are going to be storing content that is like the, the one that we mentioned before, sites that are mostly static, and you have the knowledge and all your team has the knowledge, the SQL knowledge, go with the SQL database because it's not only a technological decision, it's a, a team decision, it's a business decision. If all your team knows how to write SQL code and they can do it really fast, why would you want to you know, put them under the stress of a learning curve, of you know, the time that is required to learn this database? So always when people make architectural decisions, they have to think of all the components and it's not only technology, it's people, it's business, it's time, it's money. Can you go with document databases? If I go really biased, I would say yes. I think it solves most of the cases. But yeah, there are other considerations, not only the technology, right? Also what you like doing, what, what your, your team is ready to, to go for and what makes it simpler for you to deliver in the end. Well, Natalia, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, here at the end of the show, what we like to do is kind of cap things off with a, a final thought. So I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to think that through a second. So Mr. Bell, what, what's your final thought of the day? Well, I, I, uh, I read a book. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, it's not often that I get to read a book. Uh, and uh, I, I read a book that I want to talk about, or at least briefly. And that is um, a biography of John Maynard Keynes called The Price of Peace. Uh, and it's really brilliantly done. Uh, it, it, I like, you know, I'm not great with economics, but, uh, but, uh, but I kind of remember it from college. And this sort of refreshed my understanding and actually improved my understanding. So I didn't have to go read Keynes, you know, the general theory, <laughs> uh, which is impenetrable. Um, it's not the, the three volume official biography that a lot of people are, refer to. No, this is very accessible. And best of all, it works very hard to relate um, uh, the intellectual and historical context in which uh, Keynes evolved his ideas hmm. with, to, with our own problems in the last, uh, well, in this millennium, uh, and the way in which we're approaching our own economies. And, and there are startling insights in there regarding laissez-faire, regarding, uh, you know, uh, uh, scarcity, the fact that we don't live in a scarcity world anymore. Mm. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, it feels scarce sometimes, like when I don't have what I want, but I mean, it, you know, as, right. as, as humanity goes, uh, we're not all scratching in the dirt just to get by anymore. Um, and that has, that has implications for our economic systems and for what we think about trade and stuff like that. Uh, now I don't know whether, you know, that seems, that doesn't, that sounds like a snooze to a lot of people, but I found this book to be a page turner, absolute page turner. I am gripped by it. So I am putting it in our show notes. I beat you to it. It's already there. And uh, oh, I, I think it's go. I think it's a really good uh, recommendation. I have always found uh, economics and economic theory fascinating. I've never been any good at it. Uh, I remember in college I took a test and I was sure I aced it and I got it back and I got a, a, a big fat F on it. But you know that's life sometimes. So uh, on the other side of reading, we all tend to do a fair amount of writing from time to time. And uh, the the Hemingway app. I don't know if anyone if you've ever seen it before, but if you, it's a website that you can go in, you can plug some text into it, and it tells you if you are writing run-on sentences, if you're using passive voice, if it, it, it tells you the grade level on which your your text uh, registers in at, and it can help detangle your your thoughts often. Nice. So yeah, HemingwayApp.com. So I no longer have to write like F. Scott Fitzgerald and <laughs> passive phrases. Not unless you like want to. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I love it. You know, I'm a huge Hemingway fan. Um, one of my favorite uh, little anecdotes about him is uh, he had a little, he put together a little contest with his friends about to come up with a, a short sentence that would be the lead 
to a story that would immediately grip you. Mm. And one of his winning entries, I thought, was, was this. Um, baby shoes for sale, hardly used. <laughs> There's so many Just imagine things you can do with where that, that goes. Right? Just, wow. Wow. <laughs> that is so full of pathos. <laughs> baby shoes for sale, hardly used. And it's, that's a, that is a Hemingway set, right? Sentence, if ever there were, <laughs> were one. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my final thoughts, I, I mean, I can link it to that. We all like to read. We all like to, to write and, and writing is also an exercise of, you know, self-introspection, but also when we are choosing our technologies, it really works to sit down and and write about what you're trying to accomplish and what problems you want to solve. So you can maybe use that app, I don't know, but you can definitely use many other apps and sit down and, and think at large scale, what problem am I solving? And then uh, when you think about the problem, the people that is working with you, like I mentioned before, then think about the technology you want to use that it's really going to solve the problem while making your team happy and probably your stakeholders as well. So that's that's my final thought. <laughs> don't 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 make choices upon hype. Make them I like that. Yeah. Oh, I, I never do no, that. I, yeah. I'm sure. uh, but wait a minute, there's a sale on <laughs> aisle three. I've got to get that <laughs> pet rock. The shiny object syndrome. Uh-huh. Yeah, this is. God. Come on, admit it. You love the shiny object. I, we all love the shiny object. I bought this this yeah. uh, keyboard with the copy paste from Stack Overflow. <laughs> <laughs> God, you should do that. Like, what was the last shiny object you bought that you're ashamed of? Oh, yeah, that, that's a it's great that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I put it together with a couple of friends, so I feel less guilt. <laughs> <laughs> Strength in numbers for sure. Well, Natalia, thank you so much for for joining us again. Um, Thank you, our dear listeners, for joining us each and every week on Thursday afternoons. And uh, we look forward to talking to you and hearing from you soon. 